Uchain Bursia, on the surface of it at least, looks pretty similar to a lot of the other large predators that were around during the Permian. And by that I mean it had a kind of longish body, somewhat squat legs, and pretty long saber-like teeth. The tooth thing can actually be seen a little bit better in some of its relatives, or even larger, like Innostransevia, which was almost twice as large. But there's also some really important differences that Uchain Bursia had that helped to suggest that it was really, really different, at least in some of the ways it behaved. For example, it wasn't quite as straightforward as Innostransevia as big animal that's a predator, bites smaller prey, and wins the battle. It's a lot more complex when we start looking at Uchain Bursia. But they also had some similarities. For example, if you look at the skull of Innostransevia, a lot of those kind of features are going to be the same. Most notably, this hole here that's going through the side of the back of the skull. And that's because that powered muscles that help to power the jaws. And it's really interesting and important for understanding how many of these animals started to evolve. Because this helps to separate them out into the synapsids as opposed to the diapsids. In reptiles, there's actually an additional set of these holes in the skull that help to power the jaws which means that Innostransevia and Euchambersia were actually much more closely related to mammals than to any reptile. This group has also been sometimes called the mammal-like reptiles, and that's just a complete misnomer at this point. It's probably more correct to say that they were stem mammals. It's kind of this lead up into when the first mammals would actually evolve. Now, it's gonna still be debated how mammal-like they may have been. For example, if they may have had even whiskers just to be able to kind of feel around for prey in the dark, that's still debated. But also, they still probably laid eggs, and sure, there's some mammals like the platypus that do lay eggs today, but those lineages hadn't even evolved yet. In fact, it would take another tens of millions of years for those lineages to start evolving. So, for all practicality, it probably laid eggs, and it probably wasn't really producing milk. So that's another thing that we see very, very basally in the monotremes where they don't even have like the proper nipples to actually attach the babies to, and so they just have sweat patches that produce the milk. And yes, the babies do still eat that milk, but again, it's helping to show that that kind of complex mammalian behaviors that we expect to see probably wouldn't have existed even before the mammals actually evolved. And there were a few other synapsid predators during the Permian even before Euchambersia and Anostransevia. For example, you have Dimetrodon and Sphenacodon. But it's really interesting to understand that the synapsids were very successful early on, and the group that includes Dimetrodon is the Polycosaurs, which eventually got displaced by the Therapsids. And the Therapsids were pretty diverse too. There's one group, the Tapnocephalids, which were actually entirely herbivorous. But you also had the Therocephalians, which includes things like Enostransalia and, by extension, Euchambersia, which I'm going to be getting to some of its more unique traits here in a moment, but it's really important to understand that they weren't the first major predators on the land. Instead, it seems like the Polycosaurs were, and then they started to take over. And there's a few traits that really seem to help support this, one of which was the slightly larger size on things like Dimetrodon, but also those saber-like teeth, which, while we don't fully understand how they worked in animals like Innostransevia or Euchambersia, it's important to understand that they also had this post-orbital bar, or this little bar of bone right behind the eye. This has been shown in some other animals with saber teeth, most notably Thylacus smilus, to potentially help stabilize the entire skull. So it could have been something specifically that evolved in order to help support those teeth. Euchambersia, though, potentially had something that was a little bit more hidden of a trait that actually would have really helped it to become successful. And the reason I say potentially is because we don't know for sure. When you look at the skull, you can tell it's a bit different shape than some of the other animals that I've already mentioned. And that's because there's this giant depression or fossa in the maxilla bone. And there's potential that it may have held venom sacs, which is really, really interesting. The evolution of venom may not be as complex as you might expect. There's already certain chemicals in saliva that can be toxic. And so just higher concentrations of those chemicals can be evolved over time if it helps the animal catch prey or defend itself because, as we have seen, venoms can be used for either one of those purposes. This means that the main question a lot of researchers are asking about Euchambersia is, was it actually venomous or not? And there have been a couple of different ways that researchers have tried to approach this. When it was first described in 1931, it was kind of the end of the initial boom of paleontology. And the researchers who actually described it did say, hey, this thing might be venomous because we see these weird canals in the teeth and also this big depression also exists. So there is a chance it could have been venomous. 
This was all based off of two South African fossils of Euchambersia. And for 86 years, it seemed like that was pretty much the case. It's kind of a, maybe we had one guy look at it way back in the 30s, and then we never really touched it again. But then some new specimens popped up coming from China, which as much as during the Permian, it was Pangaea, all the continents were together, South Africa and China were still pretty far apart, meaning that this animal was pretty successful. Euchambersia was able to survive at the very southern part of the planet, and also pretty far north. It was successful. And the Chinese specimens were actually really nice because they're even better preserved than the ones from South Africa are. The geologic forces that actually preserved the fossils in South Africa were much more hard on the fossils, meaning that the skull shapes were actually deformed, and researchers were able to do CT scans and essentially undeform the bone, and then also look inside of it and look for some different kinds of features. For example, it seems like there may have been a canal that was actually running from this large depression in the maxilla bone up to the large canine-like teeth. These researchers also looked at other therocephalians in order to understand if they all have this canal and so if it's just not that important that it actually exists. And based on what they found, no, this canal is totally separate from the nasal passages and seems to only exist in Euchambersia. So good evidence that it's doing something really unique with those large depressions. However, the researchers also looked more closely at the teeth because they undeformed the skull and could actually do that kind of work. And it seems like the teeth weren't actually grooved like the initial descriptions had suggested. It seems like they may have had actually a ridge, which maybe venom could try and flow down that, but it's not what we normally expect. In things like Gila monster teeth, which also have a venom, you see grooves on the teeth as opposed to a distinct ridge that is going up and down them. So it's really hard to say for sure again if it was venomous, because some of these traits just aren't lining up the same way we would expect them to. But that study was only done on the South African specimens because that's all that had been found at that point. Only last year was the description of the new species of Euchambersia coming from China. Euchambersia liu yudongai, which again, better preservation on the skull, which means the researchers could look at it in better detail, and they found that there wasn't strong evidence to support any kind of major venom-carrying capacity between that large depression on the maxilla up into those teeth. So it's really hard to say for sure if it was venomous again. However, they didn't CT scan their specimens, and like I said, better preservation. Hypothetically, we should get some better CT scans with that. And the good news is, in that paper that, again, was last year, they mentioned they are planning to CT scan this. So there could be something new about Euchambersia in the very near future. Because of these inconsistencies in the venomous Euchambersia hypothesis, the researchers suggest that instead of being venom glands, the maxilla bone probably instead helped to support large scent glands. And that makes sense when you think about mammals. Mammals are very scent oriented. Humans are a little bit of an exception because we just don't use scent as much as many other ones do, but most other mammals do use scent very intensely. And oftentimes they do have scent glands that are on the parts of the face that would be associated with the maxilla bone. So there's a good chance that rather than being venomous, it may have just been marking its territory or otherwise trying to communicate with other members of its species. Now with my luck, that paper that CT scans its skull is probably gonna come out next week right after this video is released, but I'll have a separate video about that if that does happen. What's important to understand is that Euchambersia was like a lot of the other predators during the Permian. It had relatively large teeth and it was running around hunting many different animals that were around, including early reptiles and early mammal relatives. It was also very, very successful. We've found it in both northern and southern hemispheres, even at that time, both northern and southern hemispheres. So it was across the planet. It did very well, and maybe venom was a part of that conversation for maybe that's why it was successful, but it could have been any number of different features that also led to that success. It could have been something about the way it ran, or just the fact that it was slightly smaller than things like Anostransevia. There's less competition potentially at those sizes for certain prey types. Maybe that's what helped it become successful. It's really, really hard to know for sure, but it was something that really helped set the stage for later mammal evolution. And while it's not a direct ancestor to the mammals, this sort of predatory niche is very similar to what some of the animals that would eventually evolve into mammals were doing. They were just a little bit smaller than even Euchambersia. And that smaller size of the animals that would eventually evolve into the mammals may be where they succeeded and Euchambersia failed. 
because it lived during the late Permian when climatic changes were happening at a drastic scale. There were massive volcanoes called the Siberian Traps releasing tons and tons of greenhouse gases. The water temperature at the equator at the oceans was 104 degrees Fahrenheit, or 40 degrees Celsius, which isn't exactly great for a lot of life that would have been in those oceans. And again, that's just the oceans. On land, it would have been dry, it would have been barren. So it's really important for understanding that during those hard times, maybe it was venomous, and maybe producing all that venom just was too much for these animals to take. Venom can be really easy to evolve if it actually has those specific requirements for those more concentrated toxins. But producing all those toxins can take a toll on a body. And so potentially Euchambersia with those toxins just couldn't keep up that production, made it harder for it to hunt, and eventually it died out. The alternative for that extinction is just, hey, 75% of life on land died and Euchambersia was one of those, but some of its relatives did actually make it through that extinction too. And that's really interesting because when we actually did do those CT scans, we only looked at one of its relatives. There might be some evidence for similar adaptations in some of the closer relatives, but we just don't know that yet because CT scanning bones can still be pretty expensive. And it's one of those things that really does slow the science down when not everyone can afford a micro CT scan machine, which very first world problems, but for understanding the science is very important. So all of that is just to say that Euchambersia was kind of weird, even in this group of very diverse predators on land in the Permian. And it may have been venomous, which would make it the first known venomous tetrapod or venomous vertebrate on land, which is kind of an achievement when you think about all of the venomous animals that are actually still around, including the platypus, but also many kinds of reptile. And honestly, if it's not venomous, I'm still okay with that because it's still really weird. And if those are scent glands, why were they so massive? There's still more questions to ask to figure out more about this animal with, because it really was strange. It's not your normal just big predator run around and bite things. It's doing something a little bit different. And I'd really love to know more about what that was, but understanding that might take a little bit more time. 